Hello again, it's Lock Noob, and well, this is going to be a real treat of a video. This was sent to me w without me knowing that it was actually going to arrive by Andrew McGill. This is a lock called Enclave, and it's not a challenge lock. This is a very serious lock with a patent pending. And if I show you the keyway, you might be thinking to yourself, well, that looks easy to pick. Um, the answer is no, I've spent probably about 10 hours uh, learning about this lock, trying to pick it, thinking of ways to pick it that would work. And I've yet to pick more than four pin stacks. Um, I've been trying to uh, do one pin stack, then two, then three, then four. Um, I've not managed to get further than four pin stacks picking this. And, I, and you might think, why is that? Well, look at this exploded diagram from the patent. And that just might be your first uh, inkling as to why this lock is so difficult to pick. Now, there's so many cool things going on inside this lock, it's really hard to uh, describe just by showing, although, of course, I will take this apart and show you what is on the inside. But first, let's have a look at some video footage which Andrew has given me permission to show, which is how this lock works. It doesn't work in quite the same way that you'd expect. Yes, there is a bitting. Yes, that key corresponds to a high and a low bitting, but it's complicated by having a stack of wafers. I think there are about five wafers per chamber. And not only that, there are a set of pins which look very much like sidebar pins in that there is a gap to which a sidebar could recess into if all the pins are at the right height. Let me just take the top off and I'll show you. Got to keep the springs and anti-overlift bars in the top. I'll show you those later. But here we go. This is an interesting sidebar configuration in that instead of the sidebar rotating to the pins, the sidebar is pushed into the gap provided by these pins. You can see one of the gaps there. This way, not rotationally. So, uh, and you can see the spring there which pushes it back. It's very ingenious. What I've done to show you this, how it works in action, is I've created this little sort of cap which will slide over here. And if I screw that down, you should be able to see this sidebar move in this lock. Give me one second. So there we go. Now, there's actually more than six chambers here. There is another pin chamber at the back. And as I turn this, if it's all true, then that sidebar will slide uh, just a little bit, probably about one millimeter into the gap. And I don't know whether you can tell how it's doing that, but there is a little pin at an angle which pops up and pushes that sidebar um, inwards. So you might be able to just see something poke up here, pushing that sidebar that way. So when the key's inserted all the way and all of the cuts or grooves in these driver pins are lifted to the correct height, then of course that sidebar can slide this way into the lock by uh, this pin at the back pushing up and pushing the sidebar along. As you can see, the key is flush with the lock. However, and oh, and it rotates really freely round. It's, um, it's, it's perfect. However, if I move it to a different position, just one position out, you'll see that one of these or more of these pins is not at the correct sidebar height. But look, it looks like I can, if I get it right there, open the lock. Oh no, there's a fault in the lock. No, there isn't, because look, I can't turn it further than that position, no matter how hard I push. It will only go to about a 45 degree angle. So what's happening there? Well, something extremely clever. In each of these pin stacks is a stack of wafers. You might have seen that in some of the pictures I showed earlier. And those wafers, when you're picking them, just feel like a serrated pin. They go click, 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 click. Um, 
But at any one point where you're picking those wafers, what can happen is that the lock can turn and stop because the sidebar can't retract. There is a groove at the tailpiece of the lock which aligns with the last pin and only when the sidebar is able to retract can the pin actually push up and allow the uh, lock to spin freely. It's really, really very clever and very well thought out. So now I'm going to do two things. One, I'm going to show you how picking this lock conventionally would lead you to fall into this, let's call it a false set trap. And by the way, that's really, really easy to do. Then I'm going to take out most of the pins and pick just a couple of pin chambers to show how it's feasible you could pick it. Although, as I said, I haven't yet to pick all the pin chambers. It's genuinely very difficult. Um, and then, yeah, I'll take it all apart and see what's on the inside. So here is the lock, just in advice, and make sure it's held nice and tight. And I'm just going to put some top of the keyway tension. This is a homemade 1.6 millimeter tension tool. That's about the right fit. And I would recommend if you're ever gonna get hold of one of these, uh, if you could get hold of one of these, uh, then 1.6 millimeters is perfect for the top of this lock. Just gonna use any old pick. And I'm gonna go in and pretend that I don't know what's in here. I'm just gonna find anything binding. And it feels like six is binding. And yeah, that's about it. So I'm going to click pin six, get under it. Okay, that's nice. What's the next binding pin? It feels like three and ah, we've got an open. Oh, no, we don't. And that's what happens. You go click, click and it moves. And essentially you're stuck. What all I've done is I've moved a couple of wafers up a position that hasn't put the top driver pins in the correct position, the sidebar, let's call it sidebar, isn't able to retract across the top of those pins because all the gaps aren't aligned, which means that the pin at the tail isn't able to move out of the way to free up the full rotation of this lock. Very, very ingenious. Now, let me remove a few of the chambers and show you how it's theoretically possible to pick this lock. So, this is still gonna be very difficult. Even though I've removed the first three chambers relating to this cut, this cut, and this cut, and leaving these cuts at the back, that's because each of the wafers really acts like its own pin with its own shear line. It ties out by five in three pin chambers. Three to the power five, so a lot of combinations. Now it's gonna be a little less than that, but then you can imagine six pin chambers filled up. Each pin chamber with Essentially, it's um, somewhere, I, I can't really work it out in my head, but somewhere around that uh, uh, five to six uh, pin positions, the wafers and the driver pins, you can see how complicated it gets very, very quickly. Uh, you can do the maths if, you, if you're interested in how many possible combinations there are. Now, what we want to do is stop this from going to a false set. We can test it if we get a bit lost, but what we want to do is basically float the tension, hold it at a certain position. So I'm going to use a combination of picks. I'm going to go in and try and find pin six first. And it wasn't happy with that. Increase tension. And there we go. Now you see almost a full set, but I'm just going to back it off a little bit. Go in with a slightly deeper hook and just hold the tension until I can get a nice click out of that pin. Just one pin position, I think, to try it. Try it, and yes, there we go, we got an open. That's really careful sort of pin control. Um, if I, so that's like fully open, as you can see. And that's just three stacks. Now, you, you can end up in a lot of problems if you um, don't know where you are, so you might click a pin. That feels okay, but of course it doesn't work. So my theory about how you pick this is you'd pick a position, if you didn't know the lock, you would try to pick another uh, position, binding position, um, like this by float picking that's one and try it if that doesn't work then you might want to try two so it doesn't work and maybe you want to try the back but the thing is you don't get any feedback there is no 
different uh, difference in feedback between different pin positions at all. So you could keep going back and forth like this for ages and ages and just never get that um, elusive open. Um, and that's what makes this so good. There isn't a good feeling between set and unset that I can discern. So you could probably brute force this if you had the time by float picking. Um, and you might be able to pick it if you had the key and you knew the bit and you practiced the lock. But I practiced for a very long time. And uh, like I said, I've never been able to get past four, maybe five pin chambers after a lot of practice. Um, I certainly couldn't get a full pick on video. Maybe I will one day, hard to say. Um, but yeah, this is a, a really, really ingenious lock, right? What I think we should do is just, uh, I'll, I'll unscrew the top, we'll empty this out and we'll see what is actually on the inside. So there you can see all the pin chambers are empty, including that retaining pin position at uh, the last cut, seven if you like. I've removed the back and we can see that the plug can now be removed. That's uh, very cool, but we won't do that just yet. I want to show you a bit more about this ingenious interaction between this, and I am calling it a sidebar, I don't know what else to really call it, this sidebar and this last retaining pin. If we put the pin in, like that at the back, you'll see that it rides at the center position there and will happily allow the lock to move either way, assuming that you're in one of those full set positions. Let's then add that sidebar in, which is a little tricky because of the very good tolerances in this lock, but there we go, got it in. Now, imagine the spring's there and it's forcing it this way. If the lock is not unlocked, then what will happen is that, that the core will turn and it will try to push that pin up. So the core turns and the pin wants to be forced by the curvature of the back of the lock up against this sidebar and move it out of the way. Assuming that it can't move out of the way because the pins aren't at the correct open position, it can only stay at that position or alternatively, uh, if you turn it the other way, that position. Only when the sidebar is able to move out of the way, so if I move the sidebar out of the way, you'll see that I can actually turn the plug, might just need a, a tool to just turn it manually, you'll see that the pin will be forced up further as that pin goes up through the action of the back of the lock. So you can see how it will come back down, but it will only move past that position if the sidebar can be pushed into the driver pins. It's very, very ingenious and absolutely brilliant. So here are all the pins for you, all laid out. You can see here that we have these little metal bars in each spring chamber, and that's so that you can't over compress the springs and do an overlifting or comb attack. So you can see here that um, th that metal bar plus the height of these pins is far too much to force um, and open like that. Then you've got all these stacks of wafers essentially acting as a, um, a whole standard pin position. Uh, it's a combination between like, um, I guess, serrated pins and just a, a picked position, a picked pin position. It's this really, really clever how this works. Then some standard key pins at the bottom. Um, it really, really great design on this uh, from Andrew McGill. Uh, really great thinking. Very hard lock to pick. I've shown you me picking just three pin chambers and that took a lot of practice and memory. And I think if you were trying to pick one of these from um, um, uh, without any prior knowledge of the lock, you'd be in for some real trouble unless there was an exploit that uh, I've not found. Um, I'm not really good at finding exploits in, in locks and bypasses, I'm much more of a lock picker, but nevertheless, really interesting, ingenious design. So thank you, Andrew McGill, for sending me this fascinating lock. Uh, I, I find it really interesting. I hope you did too. I tried to make a, an understandable video, but if you 
didn't like my explanation, then I'll leave a link to some resources from Andrew himself. There's videos, there's text, there's diagrams, all sorts out there for you to read so you can read up on the lock at your own time. This is a prototype. I don't know when you might be able to buy them. If you're ever able to buy them, I hope that you would be able to buy them at some point. Uh, but as it stands, I don't think there is a way to buy them. Anyway, I hope you found this video interesting. If you did, leave a like. If you've got a comment about this ingenious lock, leave one below. Um, and if you haven't subscribed to this channel, like content like this, want to see more of it, then please do subscribe and stick those notifications on. And I'll see you all next time.